Um, yes, I'm now immediately quite conscious of the poor typography choices I've made <laughs> after we just heard from Adam on CSS. This might look really ugly, I'm sorry. But um, so for, for I'll say more as we go through the presentation, but Apollo is MDG's new thing, and it's quite exciting. Um, so MDG is Meteor Development Group, and they're dedicating quite a lot of resources to this new technology, Apollo. And um, I've recently had some chance to play with it and build a thing um, in kind of true show and tell style, like we used to do with Meteor like two and a half years ago. We didn't really know what we were doing. We just wanted to see what it could do and have a bit of fun. So this is, these are my first impressions. It is circa one month ago because we had like a window of time at Table Flip where we were kind of quite quiet and we could play with stuff that was fun, uh, since which it's been really busy and we've just been doing loads of work, uh, which is good, but it means that in a new project, which is moving quite fast, the state of the art may not today be where it was when I had these thoughts. That's my only caveat. So basically, if this is nonsense, just, it's not my fault, all right? So what is Apollo? It's, it's a data stack for client-server communication. So if you're thinking in terms of Meteor, um, it's equivalent to one part of that Meteor platform, which is live data. Um, it's managing communication between client and server. However, as I will um, attempt to describe, the, it really comes at the, the problem of client-server communication from completely the opposite end of the spectrum from Meteor's live data. Um, it's based on Facebook's GraphQL, which is this um, query language um, for um, determining the, the kind of the content you want from um, a query. Um, and it's well, I'll I'll say so. so the, the differences with live data um, are very many. First of all, it works over HTTP. This is this is as of a month ago. It, it works. It's a, and uses HTTP as a protocol as opposed to web sockets, which live data uses. Uh, which means, by default, uh, which means that there's no real-time updates from the server. The server isn't pushing data to the client. You can poll on at regular intervals if you want to, but you can't have a situation where your database is, um, the, the uplog says something has changed, you push that change to the client. Obviously, that may come in version 0. Point whatever, 1. Point whatever, who knows? Um, it would be a really nice feature, but at the moment, if you use this technology, you're using something where the client has to request data and request an update um, if, if it thinks there might be one. There is much more boilerplate than using live data with Meteor. We've all seen the, the um, example projects where you, you have kind of 10 lines of JavaScript and you're communicating from one client to a server to another client in real time, and that's, that's amazing. Um, there is a lot of magic. Meteor makes a lot of decisions for you. GraphQL makes very few decisions for you which is why there's a lot more boilerplate. But actually, for what it does, there's not too much. If you're used to building large projects, the boilerplate is very, very manageable. The really cool things about it are it's data source agnostic. So your data can be coming from SQL database, obviously MongoDB, but you know, SQL database, NoSQL, APIs, Internet of Things. Anywhere you can get data from, you can include in your, um, uh, you can kind of integrate as a data source in the same um, Apollo uh, pipe, so the, in the same stack. So your client doesn't need to know where the data is coming from. Um, the, your server worries about that. And actually, the integration of all these disparate data sources is made as easy as it could possibly be for you. And it's also view layer agnostic. Um, they have built integrations, um, much like Ollie was, was alluding to, like React and React with Redux are the two kind of primary, um, well, Maybe that's not, I can't say that because I've not tried the Angular one. But they've built a, a really nice integration with React and Redux, which actually makes life a lot easier for you in some respects because if you're using a, a REST API in, in Redux, it can involve quite a lot of boilerplate too. So the, the, it, it's made very easy for you to, to bolt React as a view layer into um, GraphQL, but you could also use it with Angular or, N, or Blaze. Um, there's Meteor integration. Um, but really, any front end you want to, um, it, it's, it's totally agnostic in that respect. There's, there's just some tools to make it easy with certain choices of view layer. In terms of your back end, you, you, um, GraphQL is effectively running a server for you. So you can have whatever, you can have like Express running your site or, or uh, Meteor or whatever else you want. Um, it's, it's effectively replacing your API. So again, it's not making any choice, choices about what's serving your front end. 
So why would, it, why would you use it? I've just told you that at the moment it's not real time and there's more boilerplate than Meteor and really the use case is in place of a REST API. That's, that's how it seems to me. Um, the advantages versus a REST API, um, first of all the schema language is flexible and expressive. You're learning a new kind of DSL again which you know so you've got just as you're getting used to ES6 and uh, ES2016 and um, uh, JSX and HTML in JavaScript, you've now got some other stuff that looks a bit like SQL in JavaScript. But actually, um, it's, it, it is flexible and expressive. Once you write your first scheme, you realize that you can go quite a long way quite quickly. The best way of, the most rewarding way of finding this out is once you write your schema, you can then get mock responses from the server straight away. I'd love to be able to demonstrate this. I have got an example app, but I don't know how to use Alan's laptop, so I'm not going to. And this is supposed to be a lightning talk. Um, but it means you, you set up your schema, which is hopefully like you know, 20 lines of code or 50 lines of code, depends how big your, your schema is, how, much, how many kind of collections or table equivalents there are in there. Um, but, but once you've set that up, straight away it will send you um, mock responses, so numbers if you, you've specified something as a number or strings if you speci specified something as a string. If you want something more detailed, you can overwrite those and use faker or whatever to say, actually, no, this sh should look like a name or you know, this should look like a, you know, a date between these dates or in this range or whatever. It's all overwritable and it makes it really, really easy for you to set up your schema and start writing your front end because you're getting back realistic data straight away before having connected it to any source, be that MongoDB, SQL, some external API, whatever it is. That means that there's going to be far fewer front-end, back-end arguments over the API design. It, you can just decide what you want and how it's connected. So, you know, your posts have an author, um, your collections are, you know, have an array of posts, stuff like that. Um, anything that's sent, you, there's no extra work. It's not like you can have, have to write a, a bunch of extra routes if people want to kind of um, there's no arguments about stuff like, well, we need to denormalize there, otherwise I'm going to have to make like five API calls. The, the schema is what the most sensible structure is for front end and back end, and you can get the data. You publish the data as it's required, and you consume the data as it's required, rather than kind of having to try to marry the two in some awkward, you know, it, uh, a potentially awkward way. That means it scales really well with respect to the number of collections or tables. That's purely speculative. If that turns out not to be true, it's just something that seems sensible to me and was completely wrong. Um, but if, if you've got a, an already quite large REST API and you start adding other things to it that have, like, uh, refer to, to other objects in the existing database, then you find that you're writing all the same kind of CRUD operations for the new um, collection or table, and then you're writing other stuff in other, the, the routes that you've already written to kind of refer to it. And, the more you've got, the more you have to write. And it totally does away with that. It's like you want to add something new or tweak something that's there, you just tweak it and that's it. It's done. Every, like all, the, all those joins are done for you by the Apollo stack. It's, I really should have had a slide on this, but the, the, the way it works is in a kind of recursive fashion. So you get a top level query. If the, your query is, OK, I want collections that kind of have uh, a name that matches this string, and they then refer to um, various posts. It will then, you will then, um, it will be directed to get those posts from your root post query, which you've already defined that says, okay, if you're looking for a post, then, you know, here's, here's the ID lookup in your, you know, MongoDB or whatever, and here's how to, like, format the data to um, return it in an ingestible fashion to the client. Um, and then, you know, if you're referring to them from somewhere else, like an author has a series of posts, you don't have to write any further logic. You just say, well, once you've got the posts, you know, refer it to the, the posts kind of root, that's a really, a, a picture would make this much more um, understandable, but it's nice, just you take that away. You can request an arbitrary subtree of all possible endpoints. In one concise yeah, in fairness, that's actually, that's exactly it. Um, and I think you already mentioned, I'm just going to gloss over the fact that he said what I tried to say in a minute in like five seconds. Um, <laughs> the um, reduces Redux boilerplate. This is just from like personal experience. Um, the fact that you like React is great and I really like it and Redux is great as well. Um, but when you start adding like kind of connect it to a REST API, you start like your boilerplate really goes up and up quite quickly. Um, and this is 
connecting GraphQL, connecting, um, sorry, Apollo to um, uh, Rack components is much like cleaner and requires much less boilerplate. Um, so it's nice in that respect. So uh, yeah, I did build a thing. Um, this is what it looks like, and it's not live. Uh, essentially, it was just a, a way of connecting to the GitHub API. We've got, um, as Ollie said, um, the four of us work at TableFlip, and we have uh, loads of projects on the go, and we're doing loads of important work, and we're responsible developers, so we don't make changes to projects that aren't on feature branches, which are then peer-reviewed and merged into staging or master or, or wherever they need to be merged into. And that's really sensible, but it does also mean that sometimes you have pull requests to like do little tweaks that you you know aren't super critical, but you think, oh, I've got five minutes, I'll just do that, and they sit there and nobody looks at them. They don't get peer reviewed, and like a month later, they're still there. So I thought, oh, I'll build something that can monitor all our pull requests and get over like all the different organisations we're part of, Table Flip, our own namespace, other companies we've we've done work for, and anyway, this is what it looks like. So um, there, there are some like red dots. Uh, again, the UI is not the most beautiful in the world, which is uh, stuff that's been out there since, in some cases, more than a year, I see. That's good. Um, we should probably look at those. Um, but the, the key point is, on the back end, it's speaking to the GitHub API. All this data is, there's no database. It's coming directly from the GitHub API. You'll have to send a word from it, for it that you, you make kind of selections, so you change the, the owner you're interested in or the repo or the user. There is some caching, but it speaks to the GitHub API and responds to you that in exactly the same way, like if you wanted to, to take that data from a database, your, your front end and your Apollo stack would look almost exactly the same. It would just be your interface on the back end that was saying, rather than speaking to the GitHub API, speak to the database and, and then return that data. It's promise based, so um, kind of the, the asynchronous problems that you might anticipate are actually relatively easily resolved. I also think that paves the way potentially to like reactive updates if they use observables or something. But building this project, like I'd say 80% of the difficulty was just learning the new stuff. The implementation was actually surprisingly easy, and I think it would be equally easy to integrate other sources of data than just like a single API and, and have that data returned in the same call. So you want something pertaining to a repo, but you also want the user's avatar from like uh, Gravatar or something like that. Uh, so to find out more, um, the docs are at docs.apollostack.com. The best place to look is the blog. There's some really, really good blog posts on this stuff um, on Med uh, Apollo Stack at Medium. Uh, that's the, the app that I've just um, described, which I think should be fairly easy to get going if you're interested in it. Um, it's designed to be run locally, so you just get it up and running on your machine, and then you can log into GitHub with your own account, and it will show you all the stuff that's relevant to you if anybody has a problem with managing pull requests. Um, and yeah, discuss. This is like the new thing, the exciting shiny toy. So please build stuff with it, demo it here, tell us what's good, tell us what's bad, talk about it. Um, because yeah, this is MDG are throwing huge amounts of resources into it, and we want to know whether people think that's a good idea. Okay, that's it.